Iridium's clarophiles and clarophyllets. In this video, I'm sort of responding to some of the things I've seen on the internet because there seems to be a little confusion about pitch levels on the clarinet and barrels and, and mouthpieces and, and what you can use and what you can't use. Um, and so uh, here it goes. We're going to be talking about mouthpieces and we're going to be talking about barrels and barrel lengths and in relationship to the clarinet and playing, a, say, different levels of pitch like 442, 440, 441, 444, yeah, you can do that on your B-flat clarinet, but it's not just as simple as sticking the right size barrel on it. Let me see if I can explain. So I've got three mouthpieces here. This is my homage mouthpiece. This is my standard professional mouthpiece, the MT-36. And somewhere here, yeah, here's a Van Doren M13. And somewhere lying around, I've got a Van Doren B45. Well, these three mouthpieces, and the B45, I had a B45 sitting here. What you would have is you would have mouthpieces that look the same, maybe play a lot the same, take the same kind of reeds, but when you put them on a given clarinet, say like this, with the same barrel, and you play open G, you find that they tune really differently. What you're generally going to find is the M13 is going to be the lowest pitched mouthpiece. Uh, this is just uh, general because they vary somewhat mouthpieces all vary uh, and let's say on my clarinet this M13 played like dead nuts when it was warmed up dead nuts 440 just right on the button then if you picked up my homage it would play about with the same barrel same barrel setup and everything it would play about 10 cents maybe between 5 and 10 cents higher Okay, and then uh, my MT-36, it's going to play probably about 12 cents higher. And then the B-45 or the 5RB Lyre or any of those standard Van Doren French shells, mouthpieces, they're going to be playing maybe 20 cents, 25 cents sharp. These mouthpieces all play at different pitch levels in relationship to one another. Now, the Van Doren, uh, the M13, is not a 440 mouthpiece. I was just saying, okay, let's say if it played 440, this is what these other mouthpieces would play in relationship. So, the way you know these mouthpieces, there are no 440 mouthpieces and 442 mouthpieces and 443 mouthpieces. They uh, they're only mouthpieces and barrel combinations that will enable you to play 440 or 441 or 442 on a given clarinet. Like, for instance, I play an homage mouthpiece on my clarinet and uh, a 35 millimeter barrel on on the 576, and I play. 440 right on the button, really well on the button, 440. Now, on the M13, on this same combination, it would be playing probably about 10 cents flat to 440. So I would need to get a shorter barrel, 64 millimeter barrel, and the M13 would probably get me up, up to pitch. So it's always the mouthpiece in combination with the barrel in relationship to a specific clarinet. You know, with my same uh, homage mouthpiece, I could play A440 with a Selmer Signature B-flat clarinet with a 62.5 millimeter barrel. How is that? Well, the acoustics of the Selmer Signature is quite a bit different 
than my clarinet or a standard buffet clarinet, and it uses shorter barrels. If you've ever watched German clarinets play, you go on YouTube and look at the one of the German orchestras, uh, one of their performances, and watch closely with the clarinet players, you'll see that the barrels are really, really short, really short. Nothing, nothing close to what we have with our French barrels. I'm not sure what the German barrel lengths are, but they're like microscopic compared to our barrels. It's quite a different acoustic that they play there in Germany. Now, you can, with a combination of mouthpiece and barrel length, you can change the general pitch level that your clarinet plays. For instance, you could play 444. Yes, that's right. Say you had to play with a Bulgarian accordionist that had an accordion that was pitched at 444. You could get your clarinet up to 444 with a short enough barrel, maybe a 60 millimeter barrel. But there would be one problem that you would run into with the clarinet that you would not run into with, say, the flute or the oboe or the bassoon. There, you just, you know, you pull the mouthpiece out or you make your read accordingly. So you Bam, you're playing 444. It's uh, not exactly that simple, but compared to the clarinet, it's quite simple. But let's say that I wanted to play 444 with my clarinet. Well, I've got a 65 millimeter barrel. I probably have to get down to a 61 millimeter barrel and, you know, a fairly warm room. Then I could play 444, and that would be really cool. But there would be one sticky wicket that would stand in my way and make me sound horrible. And uh, actually, it's a bunch of sticky wickets. It's called the throat tones. The throat tones, like all the rest of the pitches in the clarinet, they move up or down. With a longer barrel, the throat tones go flat, flatter. With a shorter barrel, the throat tones go sharper. And that would be wonderful because the clarinet's getting flatter and sharper too, just right along with the throat tones. But the throat tones don't go along. When the throat tones start to go sharper with the shorter barrel, they go much sharper than the rest of the clarinet. And when they start to go lower with the rest of the clarinet, when you put a longer barrel on, they go much lower. So maybe the whole clarinet just moves maybe 6 cents lower. The throat tones will drop 12 cents lower, or maybe even more. Or if you get a short barrel on there and the clarinet goes up to 442 and you're playing 442, because you've got a sh shorter barrel, your throat tones may go 10 cents sharper than that, and you're playing closer to 443. So you have to readjust your throat tones. Some adjustment you can do with fingerings, with long fingerings and resonance fingerings, and with your voicing, because the throat tones are kind of flexible, more flexible than a lot of other areas on the clarinet. But then sometimes you just have to flat out retune things. Or for instance, when I was uh, doing uh, the acoustical designs at LeBlanc Corporation, they wanted one of the clarinets that I designed to be used in Germany. Well, the Germans play 443. And um, someone was just saying, well, just put a shorter barrel on it, but no, not so fast. Because the throat tones go sky high. When you, when you shorten the barrel down to, say, uh, 63 millimeters, uh, yeah, 63 millimeters, then to play on one of my clarinets or one of the LeBlanc clarinets that I, I designed, the throat tones are going to go quite a bit sharp. So if the clarinet's playing 443, fine. But the throat tones are playing about 446 uh, by that. So what's going to have to happen for the models that go to Germany? It's very simple. It's not just a matter of putting a shorter barrel you're going to have to actually have those clarinets special made so the throat tones are relocated and or resized so that they play in tune with a barrel of, say, 61 millimeters or, or whatever, 62 millimeters. I don't remember because it's been a long time back in the 1990s, you know, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, that was when that was. So uh, anyway, uh, so the throat tones are things you always have to watch out for. Now... What does this mean to you? What does this mean for you? What's the takeaway here that can help you? The takeaway 
is that you have to pay attention to pitch. When you try a, a mouthpiece, it's the tendency of most people to, to feel the resistance of the mouthpiece, listen to the sound. They ask their friend, how do you like that sound? How does that sound? Does that sound good? Yeah, how about the high note response? How about playing this and playing that? Lots of stuff you can test on the mouthpiece. But you know, very seldom does anyone pull a tuner out and say, let's see what the tuning of this mouthpiece is. Let's see how it tunes. Because for most of us, we never learn and no one ever teaches us that mouthpieces play at radically different pitch levels. I, I had a, a student come in when I was working for Brooke Mays here in Dallas. This was many years ago. And she came in with an M13 mouthpiece. And uh, I asked her, I said, what's, what's the problem? She said, well, my band director sent me down to you. He said he wanted you to fix me. And I said, well, what needs to be fixed about you? And she said, I'm playing flat. And I said, okay, well, let's pull your clarinet out and just play a little bit. Let me see what you're doing. Well, she did. And when she was playing, her mechanics looked good. Her tongue position, she was getting the right kind of shape in the sound. Uh, pretty good, pretty good, pretty surprising. I turned on the tuner. She was 10 cents flat to 440. Now, I know her band plays higher than 440. And I said to her, well, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're doing everything right behind your nose as far as I can see. Uh, tongue position's good. The shape in the sound's good. But uh, the mouthpiece is uh, quite flat. I said, what, what are you playing? She said, well, I'm playing this M13. And I said, well, where did you get that? He said, well, my band director wanted me to play it because he liked the sound of it. Mmm, he liked the sound of it. Well, it just so happens that there's more to the mouthpiece than just liking the sound of it. I said, did he check the pitch? And she said, the what? I said, you know, the tuning. And I, and I just had one of my student mouthpieces sitting on the desk. Nothing great, but I just wanted to show her. I said, here, give this a try. I said, this is not the Holy Grail or anything, but uh, let's just check out the what your clarinet plays like with this mouthpiece. And so she put my student mouthpiece on, just a basic mouthpiece with a basic facing on it, pretty good little mouthpiece. Boom, she was 10 cents sharp. And I said, well, there you go. 20 cents difference between those two mouthpieces. 20 cents difference in tuning of those two mouthpieces. Band director never thought to check it. Really important. Really important. You know, when I was a young clarinet player, and uh, I know there's been vicious rumors, but I was a young clarinet player at one time, and I went backstage to talk to Harold right after uh, they had played a unforgettable concert at Yale. Uh, they did the Tchaikovsky Sixth and La Pre La Pre Midi d'un Fond and a whole bunch of just wonderful Sixth Symphony. Yeah. So anyway, I asked uh, Mr. Wright uh, at one point. I asked him, I said, well, "What's what's the first thing you look for in a mouthpiece?" And you know, like any starry-eyed young clarinet player that just didn't know crap about anything, I was looking for some kind of highfalutin, you know. Uh, description, some, you know, aesthetic uh, rant. Nope. He said, tuning. Matter of fact, first thing he looks for in a mouthpiece, got to play in tune. You know, the greatest artist, when you ask them, they don't give you these florid, um, abstract um, descriptions. They don't go off on these these artistic rants, they talk about practical things. you got to play in tune. So check the tuning on your mouthpieces. And the only way you can do that, you can't assume that a mouthpiece plays a certain way. If you're thinking about buying a piece of equipment or a barrel in combination with a mouthpiece, you like the sound of that barrel, it gives you rounder high tones, it gives you better response, or it blows freer or whatever, that may be all in wonderful. Okay, but I'll guarantee you that can change with the next read. But what generally will not change is the tuning. Pull your clarinet out, take the barrel, put the mouthpiece on it, pull your tuner out, 
and check the tuning of that combination of barrel and mouthpieces and see just what level it's playing at. You may find a combination you think is wonderful. You're in love with it. The sound is just so golden and beautiful and the response is so comfortable. And then you get in with your group and you're 10 cents flat. Or you're ridiculously sharp and you're having to pull the barrel out so far you're afraid it's going to drop off the end of the clarinet. Don't do that. You can save yourself a lot of heartache and a lot of trouble if you have a systematic way in testing equipment. And one of the first things I do whenever I test a mouthpiece is I pull out the tuner and I see how this sucker produces an open G, a written, uh, a concert thumb, a concert F. Where does it lie? Is it going to play that open G super sharp in the throat tones? Or how far am I going to have to pull the barrel out? Or what length of barrel am I going to have to use in order to play that mouthpiece? So there are all of these combinations and compromises, and you have to learn to do it yourself. Learn to test yourself and get the information yourself. All right? There's no, no substitute for that, uh, and there's no just blind taste taking of, oh, I'll just take that brand. No, there's too much inconsistency, too much variability. So that's my message. Always test, pull out that tuner, check your combinations. You'll be a happy camper that you did. Excellent. And that's my story. I'm sticking to it.